Crows rank among the world's most intelligent avian species. However, an unexpected gift from a local raven left an elderly man. Arnold Harrison. Deeply moved. Arnold's life had been filled with remarkable experiences. He met the love of his life. Amelia. In his twenties. And their inseparable bond led them on exciting adventures worldwide. After eloping and returning to their hometown, they decided to start a family. Though they cherished their shared adventures, they felt something was missing. After discussing it, they eagerly embraced the idea of parenthood. Amelia soon became pregnant, filling both future parents with immense joy. They eagerly anticipated the new chapter in their lives, eager to impart their wisdom and share the beauty of the world with their child. Nine months later, after a challenging pregnancy, Amelia gave birth to a beautiful girl they named Joy. A reflection of the happiness she brought to their lives. Arnold and Amelia proved to be exceptional parents. Nurturing Joy's curiosity, determination, and adventurous spirit. As a family, they embarked on numerous trips to various destinations. However, Joy's particular fascination lay with birds. Whenever they ventured out, she brought her binoculars and bird identification book. Eager to spot new avian friends, she encountered several rare species during her adventures, but her heart belonged to the common yet incredibly intelligent crows. Joy relished watching these crows, as they soared through the skies and tackled intricate challenges, such as cracking open tough nuts with their beaks. She often provided them with these challenging nuts, observing their problem-solving skills. Occasionally, the crows would drop the nuts onto the road, waiting for passing cars to break them open, a behavior that never ceased to amaze the young girl. Joy found immense happiness in daily feeding sessions with the crows in her garden. As time passed, she formed a small community of loyal crow companions. This ritual persisted throughout her adolescence, evolving as Joy matured into a young adult. Like clockwork, the crows would arrive each day, squawking until Joy provided them with their meals. Among these feathered friends, one crow captured her heart. This particular crow had an ordinary appearance, save for the fact that it had lost one of its eyes. In a touch of irony, Joy affectionately named the crow Blinky. Blinky held a special place in Joy's heart, and she often gave it extra portions of food as a token of her affection. In return, Blinky presented Joy with shiny trinkets it had collected. The fact that the crow was willing to share these treasures left Joy feeling both elated and privileged to have earned its friendship. As Joy reached the age where she could make her own choices, she decided to enlist in the army. She viewed it as a path filled with adventure and hard work, providing her with a unique opportunity to experience the world on her terms. Distinct from her parents' adventures, when Arnold and Amelia learned of Joy's decision, they grappled with mixed emotions. While they were proud of her pursuit of her dreams, they couldn't help but worry. Recognizing the inherent dangers of military service, they understood that a single moment could change everything. Nevertheless, they ultimately gave Joy their blessings, hoping for her safe return. One individual who couldn't comprehend Joy's sudden absence was Blinky, even after Joy left for boot camp, the crow continued to visit the garden daily, expecting his customary meals. The bird had grown accustomed to its routine, and couldn't fathom why Joy was no longer there. To greet it with a warm smile and a handful of seeds and nuts. After a week of relentless squawking from the persistent crow, Arnold had had enough. Despite their late start to parenthood, he and Amelia had enjoyed a comfortable retirement. With time on his hands, 
Arnold decided to step into Joy's shoes while she was away. Each morning, he rose early and ensured there were plenty of seeds and nuts for all the garden's feathered inhabitants. Initially, Arnold regarded his daily bird feeding duty as nothing more than a chore, a means to quiet the birds down. However, as days turned into weeks, he found himself eagerly anticipating the variety of birds that would visit each day. Without fail, Blinky made his appearance to partake in the feast. But when Arnold tried to coax the crow closer, Blinky would simply take flight. Arnold noticed that the bird exhibited a bit more hesitancy around him compared to his daughter. Nevertheless, Arnold remained determined to earn the crow's trust. After all, Blinky had been the closest thing to a pet for Joy who believed in allowing wild animals to thrive in their natural environments with a mix of patience, waiting, and offering different foods. Arnold gradually convinced Blinky to eat from his hand. The old man felt thrilled by this accomplishment, and a genuine friendship blossomed between them. Blinky became just as important to Arnold as he had been to Joy. However, a couple of weeks after their friendship had solidified, Arnold and Amelia received devastating news. Joy had been injured while on a mission abroad. Overwhelmed with worry and grief, they received minimal information from the army. Only that Joy had been injured enough to require leave for recovery. As the days passed without Joy at home, Arnold's anxiety grew. He continued to sit outside with the birds every morning, feeding them their daily bread. His somber and preoccupied demeanor left Blinky. In particular, feeling perplexed, the crow sensed that something was amiss, though it couldn't comprehend the exact nature of the problem. In an attempt to lift his new friend's spirits, Blinky started bringing Arnold an array of shiny objects, much as it had done for Joy. One day, the crow presented Arnold with an old ring. When Arnold laid eyes on the item, he couldn't believe it. It was the very ring he had given Joy when she was younger. Inscribed with the words, forever loved and treasured. Joy had lost the ring during an outing at the park with friends. And she had been heartbroken over its loss. Seeing the ring that Blinky had brought him left Arnold utterly astonished. Overwhelmed with emotion. Arnold couldn't help but break down in tears. He saw the gift as a sign from a higher power. Perhaps even a message from God. Reassuring him that everything would be alright. And Joy would return home safely. A few days later. True to his faith. Joy disembarked from her plane. Appearing a bit battered with a few scrapes. And bruises but without any major injuries. Amelia and Arnold enveloped their daughter in a tight. Tearful embrace. Relieved that she was back in their arms. Safe and sound. After their emotional reunion, Arnold shared the story of the ring Blinky had given him. He explained how the crow had been a source of comfort, when he feared the worst, and how it had reassured him that everything would turn out all right. Joy was astonished that the ring had been found, and immediately put it back on. She understood its significance, as a symbol of good fortune and love. A testament to Blinky's care for her and her family. Joy, Arnold, and Amelia continued to feed the crows in their garden. But they reserved a special place in their hearts for Blinky. They spoiled the crow with extra food and treats. While Joy was saddened by the thought of parting with her friend, she knew that Blinky would always watch over her. It was an extraordinary story. A testament to the unique bond between humans and the natural world. Feel free to share your thoughts on this heartwarming tale in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more incredible stories and videos. Sharks are fierce predators of the ocean. But when fishermen found a shark stranded on the beach, he saved the huge animal with fear. 
what he didn't expect was that. This kind action would lead to amazing rewards. For fishermen. Fishing is not divided into working days and rest days. They always work very hard to ensure that. They can catch enough fish to satisfy their customers. But not every time they go out to sea. They will go so smoothly. Which makes their life more difficult. Catch the fish up and bring them to the market. Which is a slow and difficult challenge. Because they don't have available boats. And the constant danger from sharks which greatly slows down the progress. But there is one thing that worries them even more. Because of some force majeure. They are catching slowly during this time. If the fishermen can't finish their work on time. They will be fired. So they decided to work in the afternoon. But they don't know that they are about to face another big obstacle. When fishing in the morning. A fisherman suddenly jumped back. He saw something swimming in the sea which made him so afraid that he almost fell off the boat. This is a shark. And it is not an ordinary shark. It is the largest whale shark. The most terrible thing is that it is slowly approaching. The ship and swimming around it. The fishermen didn't know what to do. But they noticed that the shark swam rather slowly. But why do sharks swim so slowly, when the great shark was halfway out of the water? A fisherman saw a huge bulge in its body. And he could hardly believe his eyes. For he had never seen such a sight before. Perhaps this shark has encountered some difficulties. But sharks are fierce carnivores. And fishermen are afraid to approach them rashly. Let alone in the sea so they can only find ways to get back to shore. Fortunately, the shark had no intention of attacking. After the fisherman landed, the shark slowly came to the beach, the badly injured body made it unable to exert its strength. And soon it ran aground on the beach. The shark is rapidly losing its life because of sun exposure. Lack of water and wounds on its body. The fisherman saw the shark's state. And knew that if he didn't save it, it would die soon. He couldn't bear to see this fresh life pass by. So he decided to save it. He expressed his thoughts with his companions. And they agreed with them and planned to help. One of the fishermen tried to pull the shark's tail. And he was immediately stopped by the fisherman. Who found the shark's wound. After all. The shark might feel threatened and attack. Which is too dangerous. So the fisherman came up with another solution. He contacted the nearest veterinarian. Who lived near here and explained the situation to her. The veterinarian said that the shark might be pregnant. And was about to have a baby. To ensure that this conclusion is correct. The veterinarian assigned the fisherman a dangerous task. She asked the fisherman to. Find the location of the lump on their bodies. Most fishermen are unwilling to do this. What if sharks attack them? The fisherman who took the lead took the lead in standing up. After all, he put forward this proposal. So naturally he can't back down. Then several brave fishermen came forward, too. They needed to hold the shark's tail and try to stretch it out. Fortune stood on their side. And the head was far away from the end of the tail. So there was little chance that the shark could bite them. Still. They didn't want to take any risks. So they took extra safety measures. The two men tried to use. Some of the hardest materials they could find. And another fisherman joined in to distract the sharks. The two men seized the shark by the tail. And all the fishermen held their breath. Hoping that everything would go as planned. But they seemed to worry too much. For the shark did not take any resistance. Now the fisherman could see exactly. Where the bulge was in the body. And they called the vet to tell her what they had found. And the fishermen were curious about what to do next. As they had never seen sharks lay eggs. But her tone changed immediately. When the vet heard the position of the bulge. If the bulge is caused by pregnancy. 
it should be located at the back of the body. But this huge bulge almost starts in the stomach. Which means that this bulge is not due to the child. Obviously. The shark swallowed something it shouldn't swallow. An immediate surgical intervention is needed if it is to survive. There was no time to waste. But the fishermen did not know what to do. So they asked the vet if she needed to come over. Or should they take the shark to her? But getting to the fisherman's place in time is a challenge for the vet. Because she doesn't know the exact location of the shark. And it's rush hour. So she may get stuck in traffic. But she must get there as soon as possible. To give the shark the best chance of survival. It's rush hour now. So she may be caught in a traffic jam. But she must get there as soon as possible. To give the shark the best chance of survival. It would take a long time for a fisherman to pick her up. But the fisherman's company should know where the fishermen are. So the veterinarian decided to go to their company. After explaining the situation to the staff. A manager offered to help her. The vet went through a worried journey. Which took a total of three hours. During the journey. The vet thought many times. Whether the shark's life was worth wasting a day. After all. Other animals might also need her help. Three hours later. The vet came to the shark. And when she could finally see it. She immediately understood that all the effort was worth it. At this time. The fishermen are waiting anxiously. During this time. They keep replenishing some water with water pipes. But the shark's condition looks worse and worse. Fortunately. They waited for the veterinarian. Now. Their first task is to inject sedatives into the shark. So that it can't attack. And also to ensure the smooth progress of the operation. Fortunately because the shark ran aground on the beach for a long time. The injection was not difficult. After a while. The shark completely lost consciousness. Now the vet can finally turn his attention to her surgery. There is something stuck in the entrance of the shark's stomach that IT can't be decomposed by the digestive system. There is only one thing the vet can do. And that is to remove this object. But surgery was always risky. Especially in this unequipped place but they had no other choice. And fortunately. The vet eventually managed to remove a strange bag from the shark. There are some fishing tools inside. Because it smells of fish blood which attracts sharks and causes them to swallow them. Ten minutes later the shark awoke. And at first he felt dazed and confused. But after a while he seemed to gain strength. And with the help of the fishermen he returned to the sea. Fishermen thought that. They would never see this shark again from now on. But what they didn't expect was that one day two months later. When the fishermen who took the lead in. Deciding to save the shark came to the sea. He saw a huge object approaching him in the water. At first he felt very frightened. But unexpectedly. The huge creature stopped at a place not far from him and jumped up. Fishermen recognized the shark almost instantly. And it seemed to be dancing in the water. Expressing their gratitude to its rescuer. The fisherman was instantly shocked. When he saw the scene in front of him. It was the most beautiful scene he had ever seen in his life. It touched the softest corner of his heart. With the vitality of life and emotional presentation. When a large black raven landed on the coffin of a young girl, confusion and concern filled the air. However, what transpired next was truly incredible and miraculous. Charity Hawkins had been born to the jubilation of the entire town and her parents, welcomed as a beautiful and lively baby. Consequently, it was expected that on the day of her funeral, 
the procession to the graveyard would draw a substantial number of mourners, all paying their respects to the little angel who had been tragically taken too soon. As the solemn procession made its way toward the final resting place, an unusual sight captivated onlookers. Perched atop a nearby tree sat a raven, its ebony feathers glistening in the bright sunlight. The bird, with its piercing eyes, appeared unusually engrossed in the proceedings, its head sharply turning to follow every movement of the casket. Emitting mournful echoing calls that resonated through the air, the raven caused a hushed murmur to sweep through the crowd. Mourners exchanged curious glances, their eyes fixed on the mysterious raven as it continued to observe the solemn event with an uncanny sense of understanding and empathy. Whispers circulated among them, speculating about the meaning behind the curious raven's presence. As the casket was lowered to the ground, the bird let out one final mournful cry, seemingly bidding farewell to a lost comrade. The presence of the raven intrigued many. Some viewed it as an omen, a foreboding sign of impending misfortunes for the town. Whispers of imminent calamity unsettled the crowd, breeding unease and trepidation. In contrast, others firmly believed the raven to be a celestial messenger, an ethereal guide entrusted with ensuring charity's soul found eternal happiness in the afterlife. They saw the bird as a symbol of hope, its majestic presence offering solace amidst collective grief. However, amidst these conflicting theories, skeptics emerged. They dismissed the significance of the raven, considering it nothing more than a coincidental backdrop adding an atmospheric touch to the already sorrowful day. These skeptics scoffed at notions of superstition and whimsy, retreating into the safety of logic and reason. To them, the raven's presence held no deeper meaning, just a chance encounter between man and nature. Nonetheless, the raven continued to captivate the attention of the mourners, casting an enigmatic shadow over Charity's funeral with its silent presence. It became a symbol of the mysteries that lie between life and death, inviting contemplation and reflection on the fragile balance of existence itself. What the mourners didn't know was that Charity and the raven had formed a beautiful and long-standing bond in the few months leading up to her death. In the innocence of her youth, the child had befriended the raven during countless playtimes in her family's garden. Every day, she would sit on the grass with a snack in her tiny hand, and every day, the raven would swoop down playfully, diving and darting to catch the delectable treasure. Charity didn't seem to mind being deprived of her afternoon snack, and her parents never realized that someone else was eating her food. This playful ritual bonded the two souls in a unique camaraderie, a strange friendship that the child herself was too young to understand. Tragically, Charity met her untimely demise within the very garden where the first friendship of her life had blossomed. The raven, to which Charity had become incredibly attached, had been perched high in the branches, its deep ebony feathers blending with the shadows. It observed as the calamity unfolded before him, its keen eyes filled with both curiosity and sadness, watching as Charity fell to the ground. It followed the frantic movements of her parents as they desperately summoned an ambulance, their voices trembling with fear and panic as their precious daughter was whisked away. From that moment on, the raven mourned its dear friend's absence, its sorrowful calls echoing through the now empty garden where once laughter and friendship had flourished like blossoms in the warm sun. The once inviting atmosphere now hung heavy with grief as the bird's mournful cries seemed to carry the echo of their memories, forever etched in its aching soul. Could ravens truly mourn? Well, this case seemed to prove it to be true. However, fate would reunite the raven with its beloved playmate on the day of the funeral. As the casket slowly descended into the earth, the raven's keen eyes caught a glimpse of Charity's serene face within. Unable to resist the allure of his dear friend, the bird gracefully swooped down, landing tenderly upon the polished wooden surface, gazing into the depths of the casket. It let out a series of mournful calls, seemingly attempting to rouse Charity from her eternal slumber. The crowd, now fixated on this unexpected spectacle, fell into a hushed silence, as if holding their breath in anticipation. Then, in an unfathomable chain of events, the unthinkable happened. With incredible precision, the raven began pecking delicately yet persistently at Charity's face as she lay in the plush velvet-lined coffin. The gasps of the horrified crowd grew louder, 
morphing into panicked shouts as her father, a tall, weathered man with tear-filled eyes, instinctively lunged forward. His heart pounded with a mix of anguish and protectiveness, intent on shooing away the bird that seemed to besmirch his beloved daughter's final resting place. But just before he could reach the casket, the raven plucked something from Charity's open mouth, an enormous, glistening seed that seemed to glow with an ethereal light. In a swift, graceful motion, the raven soared back into the darkened sky, its wings propelling it to seek refuge on its perch within the towering oak tree overlooking the cemetery. There, perched on a sturdy branch, the raven fixed its penetrating gaze on the unfolding miracle. Its beady eyes filled with an inexplicable sense of anticipation. The crowd stood collectively frozen, their eyes tightly locked upon the petite figure lying within the casket. Suddenly, Charity's vulnerable figure convulsed, her fragile frame shaking with an unexpected force. Each gasp for air echoed through the tense silence. Coughing and spluttering, the girl slowly came back into the world as the mourners watched on in complete shock. It was as if a miracle had unfolded before their eyes, defying all rational explanation. The initial hush of disbelief erupted into a whirlwind of jubilant cries, a wave of astonished exclamation spreading fervently through the stunned crowd. In that profound moment, the truth became undeniable, Charity had been wrongly pronounced dead, returning from the brink of eternity to the embrace of the living. Her parents, overwhelmed with relief and disbelief, dashed towards their resurrected daughter, their hearts pounding with a mixture of love, gratitude, and astonishment. Tears of unimaginable joy cascaded down their faces, cheeks stained as they enveloped her in a long-awaited embrace. The raven perched gracefully upon a nearby branch ceased to be a mere spectator and instead reveled in the profound satisfaction of having played a pivotal role in saving a life. When the medical examiner was called on the scene, he was forced to reveal that he had been wrong in pronouncing the little girl dead. Charity had simply choked on a seed she must have been terribly allergic to, severely restricting her airways and causing breathing issues. Her pulse had slowed down enough to make her appear lifeless, and the doctor had deemed it superfluous to perform a complete autopsy. Charity had only seemed dead, but in reality, she had been clinging on to life with all the might a tiny baby could display. As soon as someone dislodged the seed from her throat, she started breathing again. That someone wasn't a person but a raven. Her parents couldn't be more grateful for their daughter's friendly disposition towards wild animals and thanked the raven for its help by building a bird feeder in their garden. This way, the two friends could be together any time they wanted, and the raven wouldn't have to steal food from the girl's hands. From that moment forward, the blackbird forever held a sacred place within the depths of Charity's family and the entire community. Its presence was a constant and cherished reminder, symbolizing the extraordinary power of friendship in the boundless miracles woven into every corner of our magnificent world. So now, it's over to you. What did you think of this incredible story? Have you ever heard of such a miracle happening? What are your thoughts on the incredible bond between Charity and the Raven? As always, we'd love to hear from you, so be sure to leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments section below. Let's continue. After years of caring for lions, this man developed a special bond with them. However, that happened when he was submerged chest deep in water and a lioness pounced on him in the horrific moment. Kevin Ray Richardson was born in South Africa in 1974. He grew up in the suburbs of Johannesburg, where he lives with his family. Growing up, he briefly studied at university before dropping out. This was because his class, zoology, seemed to be mostly concerned with marine biology, and he found his studies repetitive and boring. His real interest was mammals and the wildlife of South Africa. He's always been fascinated by his surroundings, though he doesn't think his interests will expand beyond just a hobby. Things changed dramatically when Kevin was 23, working as a trainer and eventually caring for several lion cubs as young as six months old. The cubs he raised were called Tao and Napoleon. They are located in Lyon Park, not far from his house. For several years, he has been working part-time at the park, which has given him the opportunity to get involved in wildlife conservation. Due to his time working with lions and the practical experience he gained, 
he naturally became an expert in lion behavior. In fact, he still spends time with Tao and Napoleon to this day. To say they changed his life is an understatement. Since starting this job, Kevin's passion for wildlife conservation has only grown. Now, he's rising to fame as a wildcat advocate. People followed him after seeing his intimate relationship with various feral cats. Although lions are his favorite, he has also bonded with hyenas, cheetahs and leopards. In the Lion Park Sanctuary, he is responsible for managing 39 lions. Many recognize him by his famous title, The Lion Whisperer. There are lots of videos and photos of Kevin and his lions. The reason he was able to get so close to these dangerous creatures was because of his bonds with them since they were cubs. He eats and sleeps next to them most of the time, thus building mutual trust. His relationship with these lions is unique. Kevin said before that lions are not property. It is a sentient being, so you must take care and develop your relationship as you would any relationship. In 2003, Kevin witnessed a heartbreaking scene. Several newborn lion cubs were abandoned. There was a mother lion who gave birth to two cubs. Unfortunately, their mother rejected them. As Kevin was walking around the area, he eventually tripped over the newborn cub in a ditch. They are weak and hungry. It doesn't matter if they belong to one of the most feared animal species in the world. Because in that moment, they are vulnerable and desperately need help. I firmly believe that if I hadn't gotten May and Amy back, they would have ended up on the lion hunt market in some shape or form, Kevin said. Despite being highly controversial, lion hunting is still practiced in South Africa. Kevin couldn't let this happen to those cubs. Kevin put the two little cubs in his care. He brought the cubs to his sanctuary, and his bond with them has only grown stronger since that day. They were both female, so he named them May and Amy. Kevin's sanctuary has several lion cubs. One of the things that disturbed him was seeing the hardy wild animals trapped in their enclosures, even though the cages were there for their own protection. After taking in the two cubs, Kevin decided to make a big change to how his sanctuary operates. He will let the lions run free in the wild. The larger area around the park is expansive and ideal for all of his roots. He paid special attention to raising May and Amy. Because as they grow older, they lack a parent figure who can support them. Animals not raised in the wild are at risk. Sometimes they are afraid of the wild and uncomfortable in new surroundings. However, Kevin made sure that wasn't the case. One activity he often encourages is walking with lionesses, which he calls an abundance walk. They can do whatever they want. Because of this exposure, May and Amy got used to the plains of South Africa. Like a proud father, Kevin would watch them play and roam around. He was delighted to see May and Amy enjoying their natural habitat, as it was an experience they deserved. Lions, however, are not the kind of animals that can or should be tamed. Unlike our domestic cats who like to sit at home, lions are top predators whose status is recognized among other animals. They belong in the wild and have evolved to be effective hunters, no matter how much time they spend with humans, they will never be able to fit comfortably into our society. It's totally against their nature. Kevin acknowledges this change in May and Amy. Even lions that have been kept in captivity their entire lives can hunt very well. That's just in their genes. While this fact might scare a lot of people, Kevin didn't expect much from them. He sees it as something to celebrate when witnessing a lion become who he really is. When he became interested in wild animals, he knew right away that they weren't going to be like house pets. But part of the reason he doesn't want to lock them up is because he doesn't want them to be what they evolved to be. Seeing lions do what lions do is inspiring to me. Kevin said. Fortunately for Kevin, he never suffered any serious injuries from his lion encounters. However, this does not mean that he can treat wild animals recklessly. That's why even as he grows closer to May and Amy, he must always be on the lookout for the possibility that they might hurt him. There is a big river in the park. One day, Kevin decided to go swimming. Wading through the water, he couldn't ignore the rustling behind him. 
Turning around, Kevin noticed a lioness stalking him in the bushes. It's May. Through the reeds, Kevin noticed that her body indicated that she was in a hunting mood. Kevin watches her, curious about what she's doing, anticipating her next move. Without warning, the lioness pounced on him. Kevin's heart was in his throat as May's outstretched claws approached his face. Others in Kevin's position may have reacted differently. It makes sense to run away, splash water, get distracted, or even act in self-defense. However, Kevin has spent his whole life with lions. He's been taking care of May since she was a newborn cub, so Kevin stays put. Turns out all May wanted was a hug. Landing in the water after a huge splash, May curled up next to Kevin, resting her thick paws on his shoulder. Kevin stroked her wet fur tenderly. This moment is an important moment in May's life. The beginning of her life was a difficult thing to overcome. Because her mother abandoned her and her sister in a ditch, May developed a fear of water. But Kevin helped her overcome this fear because she knew he would always help her. Since that day, May and Kevin have gone swimming in the river countless times. When I called May to come swim, I saw her face change, what? Are you going to catch me? Kevin recalls, it was really an unspoken language. She looks at me and I look at her. That's trust. After so many years together, Kevin sees May and Amy as his soul mates. To this day, people can watch videos of Kevin and his lions or read his autobiographical book. Kevin Richardson has become something of a celebrity in the wildlife conservation world and has gained a huge following of fans who support his work. His vision is to save his favorite animals from extinction and use his popularity to raise awareness. Let's continue. A little girl approached a lion fearlessly. You can't believe that the lion's reaction is like this. Few people can feel comfortable around wild animals like Tippy. Tippy grew up in rural Africa. Nature and wildlife surround the village. Tippy does not play with other toddlers or children. She has wild animals to accompany her. Shockingly, she demonstrates that the bonds formed between humans and animals are just as meaningful as the relationships between people. Tippy found the true friendship between African animals in this story, which is as warm and profound as you hope. Prepare some tissues. We're going to show you amazing photos of a brave young girl and her exotic animal friends. Tippy was born into a French family. She travels all over Africa for study and work. Sylvia Robert and Alan Derger are a couple. Working together as wildlife photographers, they track and document the beauty of nature across Africa. But they did more actually. In the 1980s, this couple made a meaningful, critical push for defending animal rights and protecting nature. Sylvia and Alan settled in the Kalahari Desert surrounded by mongoose. In Namibia in 1990, they had their only child, Tippi. Their daughter joined them in the adventure. Tippi's name was inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's classic film The Birds. The main character in this film is a woman named Tippi Hedren. She is an advocate for animal rights. This seems to be a prophecy. Tippi was born a brave and free lady. Her name is so unique and powerful. Maybe Sylvia and Alan knew Tippi was going to be someone special. Tippi had no other friends to play with as a baby, so she adapted to being alone. She explored the African terrain and learned from the animals and nearby communities. After documenting their child, Tippi's parents began documenting her countless loving interactions with animals. They took some beautiful photos of Tippi with elephants, snakes, ostriches and more. But they had no plans for Tippi to venture into the jungle. Before Tippi was 10 years old, they traveled around Africa observing and studying the land and animals. Sylvia and Alan took photos of Tippi and the animals they met. These photos are both meaningful and beautiful. They capture the real connection between people and animals in the beautiful deserts of South Africa. But what the photos don't capture is Tippi's fascination with the jungle. She has been watching and paying attention to animals in the distance. But her parents ask her to stay away from wild animals because they want to keep her safe. We can see this family generally interacting with animals that humans are already familiar with. 
No matter where these animals come from, these animals are usually partially domesticated and trained to engage in agricultural farming, circus, or film work. Although they are wild animals, they have their own instincts and behaviors. But many of the animals Tippy photographed were used to being around people. That's why Tippy and her parents are often able to get close to these animals safely. Take Abu for example. He is a retired circus elephant and Tippy's friend. According to Sylvia, Tippy knew Abu before he was two years old. Apparently Tippy never noticed the difference in size between herself and the elephant. She just treated Abu equally and got used to Abu's response. It's almost like a dream. Can you imagine how real this would be? It's normal for Tippy to face an adult elephant. Abu is her friend. She talks to him and makes eye contact with him. They have a kind of kinship. This is one of many examples of Tippy using her gift to connect with other species. Tippy's other famous animal friend is an ostrich named Linda. Linda is from a nearby African ostrich farm. Linda fell in love with Tippy as soon as she saw her. Luckily, when Tippy sat on Linda and rode her bike, Sylvia and Alan took a picture immediately. Even though the ostrich was domesticated, it's incredible that Tippy can be so close to Linda, let alone take Linda for a ride. It's a connection that transcends language and species. This bold and inspiring kid brings all kinds of stories to life. Tippy's mother, Sylvia, attributes Tippy's talent with animals to her innocence and imagination. You can't understand animals the way you understand people, and you have to understand the behavior of animals from the perspective of wildlife. Tippy's born in the middle of the African prairie. She is able to communicate and understand animals naturally. Sylvia may be right. Her daughter immerses herself in the world and learns to understand animals through observation, trial and imagination. Over the years, Tippy has acquired an affectionate name, Mowgli. After the publication of The Jungle Book, she was often compared to this fictional character who grew up in the wild. She makes cross-species relationships with great ease. Tippy isn't exactly like Mowgli because she's not familiar with the other people. When she was 10, her family moved back to France. Tippy started school. According to the letter, it's hard for her to adapt to the lifestyle in Paris. She soon went back to homeschooling. As an adult, Tippy has now described this phenomenon between her and animals as her unique gift. Her philosophy is that every person in this world has a special quality. This quality can bring something to the world. Tippy remained calm even in the face of potential danger. She can connect with others without understanding the same language. She lives peacefully. Tippy continues to follow in her parents' footsteps to learn about film and photography, travel around the world and advocate environmental protection. Maybe that's why she is never afraid of strange animals. Maybe that's why she wants to explore the African jungle. When she was a kid, Tippy's parents tried to keep her away from unpredictable dangers and urged her not to explore the jungle alone. As she grew up, the more she interacted with different types of animals, the more she yearned for the mysterious world beyond the tree line. After all, she is a natural social person. One day, Tippy escaped her parents' supervision. With more courage than most adults, she went into the jungle. It wasn't long before she explored the game reserve when she came across a majestic wild animal. You won't believe what happened next. As fate would have it, a lone lion roamed there. They slowly approached like magnets. Finally Tippy came face to face with the lion, one of the most famous carnivores. But it's not just a lion. It didn't. No Tippy, but there's a sense of familiarity and friendliness between them. So Tippy knew that she was not in danger. She approached the lion calmly and humbly. Surprisingly, the lion didn't try to fight or run away. The lion allowed her to come closer until they sat almost side by side. Few people has this chance to let these two creatures spend some time with each other. Sylvia and Alan spotted her not long after. They found her casually embracing the king of the jungle. They assessed the behavior of lion, describing the lion's gesture of embracing a child. 
these moments make it clear why Tippy is described as having magical talent. She can tame wild animals. Like her encounters with other African animals, Tippy emerged unscathed from her encounter with the lion. What kind of feeling is this? Tippy posted incredible photos and more details about her amazing story. She is currently continuing her education. She continues to travel and support environmental advocacy work. She still strongly identifies with her birthplace, identifying herself as both African and French. Tippy reminds everyone how beautiful the natural world is and how easy it is to coexist with millions of other species. Do you have the courage to embrace wild animals? Sasha was an adventurous soul from her early years. Preferring the company of boys and engaging in activities like climbing trees and scaling fences after school. Ignoring her parents' warnings and their attempts at appreciation. She was fiercely independent and resisted conforming to their expectations. As she grew, her indomitable spirit led her to the city with a determination to carve out a career in geology, a field her mother decried as unsuitable for women. Sasha, however, was undeterred and pursued her passion with ease, excelling in her studies without a hitch. Her academic journey took a significant turn in her third year when she attended a youth party that would change her life. There, she met a man known affectionately among peers as Petrovich. Due to his mature demeanor and history as an army veteran before he joined the Institute of Forestry, his real name was Serge and he captivated everyone with his guitar skills. But it was Sasha he chose. Their relationship developed rapidly and with intense passion, Sasha, so smitten, decided to leave her studies behind to join Serge in a remote village where he was assigned to work for three years, without even informing her parents of her decision to avoid their disapproval. She wholeheartedly followed Serge, planning to settle in and then break the news to her family life in the village, however, was not as romantic as Sasha had envisioned. They were allocated an old, drafty house, and Serge, consumed by his new role as a gamekeeper, would often disappear into the forest for weeks. He felt it necessary to immerse himself fully to gain the respect of the locals, assuming the nickname Petrovich which the villagers had given him. Meanwhile. Sasha felt isolated and trapped, unable to connect with the local women or forge any meaningful friendships. The situation grew more complicated when Sasha realized their relationship had no official standing, she was neither Serge's wife nor fiancé. Talks about their future made Serge irritable. However, when Sasha became pregnant, they eventually married a year after their move, and she gave birth to twins. Pasha and Natasha. Serge's reaction was lukewarm, and he increasingly withdrew into his work in the wilderness, leaving Sasha to handle home affairs and the twins on her own. Serge's behavior became more secretive and aloof over time. He built various hidden shelters across his territory, and his frequent absences coupled with his reticence left Sasha feeling abandoned and anxious, sensing that deeper issues were troubling him. Despite her attempts to support and understand him, the joy and connection that had once defined their relationship seemed to be fading. Overshadowed by the growing challenges and mysteries in their life in the remote village, Petrovich had always been reluctant to entertain local officials or host them on hunting trips. And over time this reluctance had evolved into a sort of routine. He confided in his wife, Sasha, reassuring her, Be patient. Soon I'll have completed my three years of service here, and then we can leave this place forever. Despite his assurances, the bond and understanding they once shared seemed to have diminished. During one such hunting event with the local officials, a tragic incident occurred where Petrovich was involved in the accidental, or perhaps not so accidental, death of a man. 
Serge argued that he had been set up, a victim of his outspoken nature. But their claims fell on deaf ears. The court sentenced Petrovich to four years, leaving Sasha alone with their children in the village. Despite offers from her parents to come and stay with them, Sasha chose to remain in the village, finding work on a farm and dedicating herself to raising her children and awaiting her husband's return. As the years passed, the children grew. One day, her son Pasha discovered a crow alone in the forest. Curious and compassionate, he brought it home, asking, Mom, what are we going to do with him? Sasha, fostering a love for nature and her children, decided they would care for the crow. They built it a large cage, fed it worms, and named it Sid. Over time, Sid the crow thrived, becoming a beloved member of the family, often perching on Pasha's shoulder and exploring the kitchen freely. When Serge returned from prison, he was a changed man, hardened and volatile. His temper, fueled by alcohol, often led to aggression towards Sasha and the children. Sasha, resilient as ever, stood up to protect her children, her spirit unbroken. She refused to be a passive victim, despite the physical advantages her husband held over her. One harrowing day, in a fit of rage, Serge locked Sasha in the barn. By the time she managed to escape, he had taken the children into the woods. Frantically, Sasha searched for her children, her home eerily silent, Sid's cage ominously empty. When she realized that something terrible had occurred, her mind raced with worry about where to search for Serge and the children. The IGA was vast. A complex maze of territory Serge knew like the back of his hand. Filled with countless secluded spots that were practically invisible to the untrained eye, Sasha knew she would get lost almost immediately in such a labyrinth and space, rendering her efforts futile. Overwhelmed and uncertain, she hesitated to involve the authorities. Her fear was that Serge could end up in prison again. But deep down, she still harbored a glimmer of hope that everything could be resolved peacefully. She believed that Serge, in his own twisted way, was exacting revenge by using the children to inflict unbearable pain upon her. Despite the perilous situation, she clung to the hope that Serge would protect their children. However, as the hours turned into a day without their return, Sasha's anxiety only deepened. By the next evening, a certain dread had settled in, only to be momentarily disrupted when Sid suddenly appeared in the yard. He carried something in his beak, it was the bow from their daughter Natasha's hair. Sasha's heart sank, yet she tried to stay composed, telling herself that perhaps the bow had simply fallen off. But when the raven, cleverly named Sid, returned the next day with a button from their son Public's jacket, Sasha was overtaken by panic. It was clear the children were sending her desperate signals, driven by maternal instinct. She followed the raven late into the evening, navigating through dense forests, over ravines, and through thickets. Finally, she discovered the children hidden away in one of the dugouts, cleverly concealed from the eyes of passers-by. The door had been barred from the outside with a heavy log, but through a broken window, her son Pasha managed to pass the items to Sid hoping they would lead their mother to their secret hideout. Once she freed them, Sasha's relief was palpable. Yet the question of Serge's whereabouts hung heavy in the air. Pasha, innocent and hopeful, asked if they would find their father. Sasha, now grappling with the harsh reality, suspected they might never see Serge again. Her fears were confirmed days later when Serge's body was discovered in the river. The circumstances of his death remained unclear whether it was an accident or something more deliberate. No one could say for sure. In retrospect, 
Sasha was immensely grateful for the intelligence and resourcefulness of the raven. Sid. Without his help. The children might have endured a far worse fate in that concealed dugout. The thought of what could have happened haunted her. After watching this story, how do you feel? Feel free to share with us in the comments section below. And then there is another similar touching story. Next, let's continue to see another similar story. Stuart had been a devoted bird enthusiast throughout his life. Living in Seattle, he was well acquainted with the region's rich avian population. From a young age, he had felt a kinship with birds, particularly robins and magpies. However, it was the crows that captured his attention after he moved into a new home with a wilderness at the back. He spent the initial months observing the crows, gradually feeling a deeper connection with these intelligent creatures. Curious about his new feathered neighbors, Stuart delved into research and was astounded to discover that crows are among the most intelligent bird species. Their cognitive abilities are so advanced that they possess working memory strong enough to remember individual appearances and even recognize themselves in reflections. A trait hinting at self awareness. Intrigued, Stuart started an experiment. He filled bird feeders and placed small mirrors near the crows' nests hoping to observe their interactions with their reflections. Monitoring the results was challenging as he couldn't spend all day watching. But he noticed that the crows seemed to appreciate the food and collected the mirrors, possibly attracted by their shininess. Though he couldn't confirm if the crows actually used the mirrors for self-viewing, he didn't dismiss the possibility. The focal point of his observations was a nest in a Douglas fir tree in his front yard. Stewart continued his research, learning more about the dietary preferences of crows. Unlike common bird feeding practices that often include seeds and corn, he discovered that crows did not favor corn. Experimenting with various food combinations, Stewart found that denser, more nutritious foods attracted an increasing number of these black birds. Through his dedication, Stuart refined his feeding strategy to better cater to the crows, creating a specialized mix that drew them in greater numbers. His commitment to understanding and nurturing his relationship with the crows turned his backyard into a lively hub of avian activity, deepening his appreciation and love for these remarkably intelligent creatures. Stuart's property truly became a paradise for him. A dream realized as he expanded his passion into his backyard by adding an array of bird feeders. Over the years, he found solace and companionship in the presence of various birds, particularly enjoying the company of crows during his nature walks, where they often accompanied him by flying overhead or perching in nearby trees. There was one crow that particularly caught Stuart's attention due to its distinctive limp. It seemed one of its legs had healed incorrectly after an injury, making it rely more on its other leg for mobility. Stuart! moved by compassion, took special care of this crow, delighted when it chose to make its home in the fir tree just outside his door. The old nest there, left by previous crows, served as a perfect foundation for this crow to establish its residence. To welcome his new neighbor, Stuart began leaving out special treats. Over time, their bond grew stronger with the crow learning to recognize Stuart and showing visible excitement whenever he stepped outside. After about a year, their friendship had solidified, and the Douglas fir tree became the crow's permanent residence. The other birds seemed to respect this arrangement, frequenting the backyard feeders while leaving the front yard to this special crow. Stuart and the birds enjoyed a peaceful coexistence for a considerable period. However, Hosting a large number of crows eventually led to unforeseen consequences as it began to attract predators. Raccoons, swift and cunning hunters, posed a new threat to the safety of the birds. Initially, Stuart discovered a deceased crow on the outskirts of his backyard but considered it a natural part of life, his research having informed him that crows generally have a lifespan of seven to eight years. However, the disappearance of several young crows raised his concern. 
upon discovering raccoon tracks nearby. Stuart realized these predators were targeting his feathered friends. In response, he implemented several precautionary measures to deter the raccoons, striving to protect the birds. While not a foolproof solution, these efforts largely kept the crows safe and well-fed thanks to Stuart's vigilance. Time passed under this new status quo until one day. Stuart noticed another crow lingering around his fir tree. Initially, he suspected it might be trying to usurp the space from the injured crow that had made it its home. Yet, after observing for a few days, Stuart realized that this new crow wasn't a rival but another bird in need of sanctuary. This realization marked a new chapter in Stuart's ongoing story of companionship and stewardship with the birds in his backyard. In the quaint front yard of Stuart's home, a delightful surprise awaited him one sunny morning. Nestled within the branches of a sturdy tree, two tiny crow eggs lay securely in a carefully constructed nest. Stuart, a passionate bird watcher, was overjoyed to discover that his favorite crow had started a family right outside his window. Driven by his excitement, Stuart sprang into action. He began leaving special treats scattered around the yard to support the soon-to-be crow parents, providing everything from seeds to small chunks of fruit to ensure they had all they needed. He watched over the nest with a protective eye, determined to safeguard this budding family from any potential threats. As time passed, the eggs hatched, and two healthy baby crows emerged, greeting the world with their soft, curious calls. Stuart was thrilled to witness these precious moments and quickly became even more invested in their well-being. The baby crows, in turn, grew accustomed to his presence from their earliest days, associating him with safety and sustenance. The crow family flourished under Stuart's attentive care. The fledglings developed into tame, affectionate birds, their trust deepening with each day they spent under his watchful eye. The parent crows, too, recognized his benevolence, often perching nearby, watching as he tended to their needs. As weeks turned into months, Stuart's backyard transformed into a sanctuary not just for this family of crows but for many others. However, none came as close to his heart as the family of four residing in the Douglas fir tree. Over the years, he had the privilege of observing the young crows mature into fully grown adults, a process that filled him with a profound sense of fulfillment. Although Stuart longed to help more directly, such as repairing the father crow's injured leg, he realized some things were beyond his abilities. Instead, he adapted his approach by placing small, soft items in the nest to provide additional comfort to the injured bird. While he wanted to do more, he understood that the crow's improved quality of life was largely due to the love and security provided by its family. Just when Stuart thought life couldn't possibly be more rewarding, a touching gesture from the crows left him deeply moved. One ordinary day, he found a small piece of fur on his welcome mat. A gift he suspected was from his feathered friends. It was their way of reciprocating the kindness they had received from him over the years. This simple act of gratitude not only confirmed the special bond they shared but also reminded Stuart of the profound impact of his kindness and love. In an astounding discovery that would touch anyone's heart, Stuart stumbled upon an incredible sight that confirmed his suspicions about the unique relationship he shared with the local crows. While investigating a peculiar arrangement nestled in a tree branch, Stuart found a shiny silver pull tab, the kind commonly seen on soda cans, embedded about halfway through the branch. Upon closer examination, as he lifted the branch, a cord tied around it revealed that this was no ordinary piece of debris. This intricate setup turned out to be a gift from the crows. A gesture of gratitude not unlike the small mirror Stuart had previously left out for the birds. It was a moment of realization for Stuart. The crows had crafted their own piece of art. A token of appreciation and a symbol of the bond they shared with him. Overcome with emotion. Tears streamed down Stuart's face as he grasped the depth of this heartfelt exchange. 
from that day forward. Stuart was proud to declare to anyone who would listen that he had four crows as pets. This poignant story beautifully illustrates how even wild creatures like crows can form deep, meaningful connections with humans who show them kindness and attention. Did you know that birds as untamed as crows can forge such strong relationships with humans? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Next, let's continue to see another similar story. Brooke was a beautiful and spirited young girl who spent her early years in a warm, nurturing environment in a quaint village in Cornwall, UK. Her home was a haven of joy and love, with her mother dedicating her days to managing the household and caring for Brooke, while her father, a sailor, often spent long periods at sea, despite missing him terribly during his absences. Brooke relished the exciting moments of his return, eagerly anticipating the unique and fascinating gifts he brought from his travels, a collection that included seashells from Caribbean beaches, intricate sculptures from distant Middle Eastern lands, and an assortment of books and toys from various corners of Europe and America. One sunny afternoon, after waiting anxiously at the garden gate for her father who had been away for two months, Brooke's eyes sparkled with delight as she spotted him approaching. She ran to him with unbridled joy, leaping into his arms and showering him with hugs and kisses. However, she quickly noticed something unusual, her father didn't have a wrapped gift in his hands. As was their tradition. Sensing her curiosity, he knelt down and gently placed a small, twitching object into her hands. To her surprise, it was a tiny raven chick, barely a week or two old. Her father explained that this gift was special and tasked Brooke with taking care of the chick, teaching her responsibility and the importance of nurturing. Brooke embraced the challenge with enthusiasm, integrating the young raven into her daily adventures. She spent endless hours in the garden, where she had always loved observing the plants and the playful insects. The raven became her constant companion climbing trees and exploring the streams and meadows with her. Brooke's carefree and adventurous spirit never waned. Even when her explorations led to torn clothes and scraped knees, none of that mattered as long as she was having fun. Tragically, Brooke's vibrant life was cut short when she died unexpectedly for reasons unknown. At her funeral, a poignant and miraculous event unfolded. As loved ones gathered to mourn, the raven, which Brooke had raised with such love and dedication, perched solemnly on her coffin. This heartrending scene underscored the profound bond between Brooke and her feathered friend, leaving an indelible mark on all who witnessed it. Though Brooke was only six years old at the time of her passing, she had lived a life full of strength, beauty, and independence. Her legacy embodied by the raven's loyal vigil, continued to inspire and resonate with those she left behind. A testament to the young girl who loved life and embraced the world with open arms. Brooke initially felt overwhelmed, but a spark of realization lit her face as she came to terms with the significant responsibility she was about to shoulder in the coming weeks. She devoted her days to caring for a raven, providing it with food and water and even teaching it several tricks. Ravens, known for their intelligence, quickly grasp what they are taught. And this one was no exception. It swiftly learned from the young girl's instructions. As the days passed, the chick matured and mastered the art of flying. Brooke would often take it outside, watching with joy as it soared through the sky, always returning to her despite the freedom to fly away. The bond between the girl and the raven was unmistakable. However, tragedy struck one day while Brooke was relaxing under a large tree in the garden. Suddenly, she stopped breathing and clutched at her throat. The raven, sensing distress, began squawking loudly, alerting Brooke's parents who were inside the house. Upon seeing their daughter in distress, they rushed outside. Without a second thought for the raven, they scooped Brooke up and hurried her to the nearest hospital. 
Meanwhile, the raven perched itself on a tree, watching as the car disappeared down the street. It then flew through an open window into Brooke's room, settling on her bed. At the hospital, doctors immediately began to assess Brooke's lungs. As a young and previously healthy girl should not have breathing issues, they performed scans to ensure there were no underlying problems and worked to restore her breathing urgently, as lack of oxygen could cause severe and permanent damage. While the medical team did everything they could, Brooke's parents stood by, tears streaming down their faces. Despite the doctor's best efforts, Brooke was declared dead. Outside the hospital room window, the raven continued to peck at the glass and squawk loudly, attempting to draw attention. But the hospital staff shoot it away, deeming a hospital no place for a bird. Heartbroken, Brooke's parents returned home the raven following and pecking at their car, still trying to capture their attention amidst their grief. They, however, were too engrossed in their sorrow to notice. As they began funeral preparations, the raven persisted in its attempts to connect, but to no avail. On the day of Brooke's funeral, her family, friends, and loved ones gathered mourning the young girl as she lay peacefully in her small, open coffin. The raven, ever loyal, stayed close by, a silent witness to the profound sorrow that enveloped the day. When they gathered to bid their final farewells, Brooke lay in her coffin, looking frail and innocent, reminiscent of a precious porcelain doll. Her untimely departure was a shock to all and the room was heavy with palpable grief. Many mourners couldn't hold back their tears as they approached Brooke, gently stroking her face and planting soft kisses on her cheek. Among the attendees, one unexpected figure caught everyone's attention, a raven perched solemnly in a nearby tree, its presence both mysterious and poignant. Throughout the ceremony, it intermittently flew overhead, circling the mourners with a loud, calling noise. Brooke's parents watched breathlessly as the raven swooped down, landing on the coffin with a curious gaze fixed on Brooke's body. It began making a strange, buzzing cooing sound, almost as if posing a question, hopping eagerly from the lid to the side and back again. After several minutes, the bird unexpectedly started pecking at Brooke's body, as though trying to rouse her from sleep. This display of what appeared to be grief touched her parents deeply, though they knew the raven could not be allowed to continue disturbing her rest. Despite their attempts to shoo it away, the bird persisted, focusing particularly on her mouth. To the family, this behavior seemed disrespectful and was difficult to watch, but it soon became clear that the raven had a hidden motive. As Brooke's father approached the open casket, Waving his arms to scare the bird away, the raven flapped its wings and squawked, but eventually retreated to its perch, still watching intently. While the crowd's focus returned to the coffin, a shocking sight awaited them. Brooke was sitting up, and on her lap was a walnut-sized egg, an object that had come from an insect and multiplied. It had become lodged in her throat after falling from the tree under which she had been lying in the garden. When rushed to the hospital, the doctors, assuming a pulmonary issue, only performed a chest x-ray, which revealed nothing. They had not checked Brooke's throat. The lack of oxygen had induced a coma, and she had been mistakenly pronounced dead. Although she was still capable of taking slow, shallow breaths, Brooke looked towards her stunned parents who, overwhelmed with relief and joy, threw themselves at her, embracing and kissing her. She was alive. In that moment, everyone realized that the raven had known all along. It had tried multiple times to communicate this critical information to Brooke's parents, but they had not understood the urgency of its message. The raven, in its own way, 
had been desperately trying to tell them that Brooke was still with them. Brooke's face and mouth were the targets of the bird's persistent pecking. A desperate attempt by the creature to clear the obstruction it sensed. Fortunately, the bird's timely intervention was enough to save Brooke's life. What are your thoughts on this remarkable tale? How would you have felt if you were attending Brooke's funeral? Only to witness such an astonishing event? As always, we love to engage with our readers. So please make sure to share your thoughts and opinions in the comments section below. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.